Something that's become a bit of a cliche on YouTube over the years is this kind of Noah's Flood, Noah's Ark, Global Flood debunking video. I suppose I've always been able to hold my head up high on those grounds in that when I look back through the videos I've made, I've never really made a video about that. I did make a video called From Noah to Abraham which the first part of the video touched on the problems that Noah would have had after the waters had, had left but really that video was more about the lifespan of Noah and how that overlapped with the lifespan of Abraham and what, what that implies and what it implied as well for the global population at the time of Abraham. But finally I'm going to sink to the depths now because I'm going to do what I haven't done all these years which is to make a, a Noah's Flood video. And that's prompted by a video that I've just watched um, from the Truth Groups channel which I think they'd relayed this video, mirrored it from somewhere else. It's always been a bit of an acid test for me this whole Noah's flood thing. I've always kind of felt that if you're prepared to prop that up uh, to try and find some way of, of, of literally interpreting that story that you probably you would be probably prepared to try and literally interpret anything. It wouldn't matter if the Bible said that we were all made out of cheddar cheese. You would try and find some way of justifying that as being literally true if you're prepared to uh, justify the Noah's Flood story. So let me play you a little clip. It's a very slick video that's been made here. I'm going to make a few clips and I'm going to make a few comments as it goes on. Lots of people say there's no way that two of every known species in the world could fit onto Noah's Ark. You know what? We agree. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible doesn't claim that's what happened. So if we really want to get to the truth of it, we're going to need to see what the Bible really says about all this and then ask three questions. <laughs> you know, I always get a little bit worried when Christians ask three questions. Ask three questions! Three questions! Okay, well, I hope this situation resolves itself a little bit better than it did back then with Tony48219. Uh, so let's hear the three questions and see what they have to say. How many animals are we really talking about? How big were they? And how big was the ark? We answer those, we're closer to understanding the truth. Make sense? Good. So how Okay, well, crack on. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. Jump ahead to Genesis 125, day 6, the same day man and woman were created, and here's what we get. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. Now, take a look at the phrase, according to their kind. What does it mean? Is it the same as species? I don't think so. It's possible that it's closer to what we call families in the typical biology class today, with some exceptions. Keep in mind that species is a man made definition anyway. Confused? Huh? Let me explain. Let's take the dog kind, for example. We'll call the female dog taken on the ark Bingo, because that's the name of my first dog. Okay, from Bingo and her mate, you can get the various species of coyote, wolf, and even domestic dogs like the Border Collie, Great Dane, Poodle, and so on. You get it? The different species we have now could have easily been generated after the flood from the information already present within the parent kind. So Okay, well this can get a little bit convoluted here. This will probably be the biggest response of any of them that I have to make in this video. And it'll get quite convoluted even though the basic rebuttals to what he's saying are quite simple. So let's see how it goes. The basic rebuttal is this. He's looking at dogs and we know why he's looking at dogs. He's looking at dogs because it immediately makes us think of the wolf and we think of all the breeds of domestic dog that we have based on wolf genetics, that it's all present within wolf genetics. We've managed to breed such fantastically different dogs as Chihuahuas and Great Danes, intelligent dogs like Golden Retrievers. So all these different facts, whether it's body size and shape, intelligence, they all manifest to some extent within the genome of that wolf population. But there's the rub. It's a wolf population. It's not between two wolves. If we only started off with two wolves, we wouldn't have all that variety. And the variety that we see within domestic dogs has come from that wolf population. It's not new mutations that sprung up. It could be that one or two new mutations, of course, have sprung up since we domesticated the dog. But the vast majority of it is present there within wolf populations because wolves have been around for a long time. They've been successful for a long time and they've got a diverse genome. 
But there's a problem here because he's only taking two dogs. He erroneously states that his dog Bingo and some other dog could give rise to all these other dogs. He's got no evidence for that. He couldn't do that as a breeding programme because simply that wouldn't happen. If he bred his dog Bingo with another dog and they had puppies and then he bred those puppies together, what would actually happen is he'd end up with a load of pretty smashed up dogs because you have this problem of inbreeding where there are some genes which is they're recessive genes and as long as you have one copy of them you're okay but then if you start breeding with your siblings you end up with two copies of them and that can cause a bit of a problem and this is where it gets complicated and this is why this is why this gets complicated to get round that what they say is this is that originally all these things started off with a perfect genome these dangerous genes which if you've got two copies of them cause problems they didn't exist because all these different kinds were perfect same as humans were perfect you see this is why all of them from Methuselah through to Noah they all lived for hundreds and hundreds of years and when we get to Moses he only lives a bit was he live 120 nowadays we don't live anything most of us don't live anything close to 120 it's because things are getting worse God made us without these uh, imperfections but but they don't carry much, they don't think evolution works very well and they think most mutations take us the wrong way, you see, and so it's making things worse and so it's the same with a dog. So the argument that I'm making now doesn't carry any weight because these dogs would be closer to perfection so there wouldn't be these deleterious effects of the inbreeding of the dogs, okay. Well, here's the problem. If you've only got two dogs and you would only have two dogs because dogs are unclean animals and he only takes two of every unclean animal on the ark, of course, seven of every clean uh, animal, seven pairs of every clean animal. So if you've only got two dogs, you haven't got the variety within the genome to give you from the family down to the different species. So what you need is after the ark, you need evolution to work in a way that it well a way that it can't work. It needs to be spewing out mutations faster than it actually does. Now the thing is with evolution, when you think about it and natural selection Natural selection needs to be able to remove deleterious mutations at least as fast as they're arising, otherwise the whole thing's going to cascade after, out of control, which is why, of course, it selects for um, the replication that's as, as, as high fidelity as it actually is, because the lower the fidelity, the more deleterious mutations that you can get. So this is the problem. They need the vast majority of mutations to be positive, beneficial mutations so that all these different breeds of dog uh, can evolve in a very, very short space of time. So on the one hand, they're saying we need lots of mutations and they all need to be positive. And on the other hand, they've said actually things started out really good and they're getting worse because nearly all mutations are deleterious mutations and that's dragging humans and all these other species down. Those two arguments don't sit together. You can make one argument one day, one argument another day, and nobody will notice. You put them side by side and you see the problem that they've got. So this is a first problem. There's just not enough genetic variety within these two dogs to sustain the argument that he's making. And there hasn't been enough time since to go from two dogs of one family to all the variety that he's claiming. Let's see what's said next. Genesis 620, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. That's as clear as it gets, folks. Simple instructions of what to take and what not to take. Yeah, you know, this is a bit where I really have to take issue with what this guy is saying. He naively says that what Noah's got and what he needs is a simple set of instructions. What a load of absolute bullshit. If we just look at Beatles, and I want you to place your, and I don't mean Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and John Lennon. I mean the little scuttly bastards that you don't want roaming round your house. 
place yourself in the position of Noah and see how this goes. There are about 400,000 documented species of beetles in about 200 families. And what this guy is saying is, we don't need to take all the different species, we just need to take a representative of each family. So let me throw you out there as Noah Mark II and say to you, right, go and get me a representative from around the world, a representative pair from each one of these 200 families of beetles. I'll wager even if you're a biologist, you wouldn't have the first clue where to start. Even if you're an expert in beetles, it's unlikely you're going to be able to pick out all of those 200 different families of beetles and make sure that you have a representative of each family without taking far more than 200 pairs of beetles just to be on the safe side. We have a lot of our taxonomic understanding is great now. We understand cladistics, the phylogenetic re uh, 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 relationships between beetles that in this case the species level and the family level we understand that now and with enough reference books and enough experts we could do the job that we're asking Noah to have done but clearly for one man to have conducted this operation just with the beetles alone he must have had more understanding of taxonomy than anybody that's ever lived before and probably if he's carrying it all in his head more than anybody will ever live in the future. And in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life? All that was on the dry land died. Okay, so he's not talking about any sea creatures being on the ark. Not the tiniest seahorse or the largest whale. Uh, because the last time I checked they weren't swimming around on dry land. What we have here is one of the most absurd ideas that I've ever heard and an idea that you can only uh, sustain if you have no appreciation for what is being claimed. Let's try and give them a best case scenario. Mount Everest is 30,000 feet. To cover Mount Everest we would need 30 feet of water every hour for 40 days and 40 nights. Bear in mind that the heaviest rainfall on record over 24 hours is 72 inches. That's 3 inches an hour. We need 30 feet an hour. So we need what we need something like about 100 times more than, than has ever been experienced in documented uh, human history. But let's try and break that down. Maybe Everest wasn't as high as it is now. Maybe Everest was only 15,000 feet then and it's grown, well it can't have done it in recent times, but maybe it's grown 15,000 feet in the 1500 years since the flood and since we get to decent record keeping, say at about 800 BC there. So what we'd be talking there is an Everest growth rate of about 10 feet a year, as opposed to the inch a year that we see now. So we need Everest to grow at about 100 times greater. So I think it's the Indian plate that's been subducted, I think, under the Asian plate or something like that. That's what leads to the Himalayas. We need that to be happening 100 times faster. We need tectonic activity around the globe to be at acting a hundred times faster than it is now imagine the volcanoes imagine the earthquakes imagine the turmoil and yet there is no record of that but that's what we would need and even with that we still need 15,000 feet of water to cover the then Everest to cover Mount Ararat so we're still going to need 15 feet of water every hour we can break that down can't we we could say well that's seven and a half feet of rain an hour bearing in mind that three inches of rain an hour is a is a, is a torrent that's hard to to, to sustain um, and, and it is hard to actually survive within rain greater than that um, and we're going to need seven and a half feet of water from the deep I would love somebody to model what would have to happen to, to raise not just sea level but water on land level seven and a half feet an hour every hour 
if all that water is coming out from fissures in the deep ocean, I would imagine the water's going to be spouting. You're going to get a water bulge a mile in the air. You think, because what we're talking about here at this part of the video is sea life. We're talking about the whales. We're talking about seahorses. He mentions some of these reefs have tremendously complicated uh, symbiotic ecosystems where every life form depends on every other life form and if you alter the salinity or the light levels or anything the pathetic really some of these ecosystems you alter anything by the slightest amount and it all goes to shit and everything dies and yet we're getting seven and a half feet of water from the deep every hour the water is smashing all over the place whales anything larger than a small animal is going to be torn to pieces with the hydraulic forces and in the meantime all the soil and everything on the land is being run off into the sea under this seven and a half feet of rain every single fucking hour what naivety to think that anything is going to survive in the sea greater than the le greater at a greater level than a single celled animal under those kinds of conditions no anything that's going to survive is going to have to be on the ark He's also not talking about plant life or single-celled organisms or bacteria. No, only things that have the breath of life in its nostrils and are on dry land. Okay, so we're not talking about plants either. All the plants are going to be smashed to pieces. I, I don't really know how the cacti are going to survive under these conditions. It's absolutely ludicrous, of course. Maybe some seeds would survive and that you could repopulate things from the seeds. But think how complicated some of these ecosystems are. One of the things that... Um, Biblical literalists and young earth creationists scoff at is the idea that these really complicated ecosystems such as you get in uh, in, in, a, in a rainforest, for example, could, could arrive. But where there's hundreds of species that are all needed to balance that ecosystem out. How is Noah going to make these ecosystems? There aren't any plants around and he's going to have to hunt out the right seeds to replant these jungles but what's he going to plant the jungles in because there's no soil it's all been washed away it's all been trashed it's an absolute absurdity one of the key things that noah would need when the floods receded apart from some fucking soil to plant things in that hasn't been washed out to the bottoms of the oceans the other thing he's going to need of course is some plants and he's going to need the right plants in the right environment and what he won't have is any plants because they've all been smashed to smithereens so you take all the young adult animals because nothing says the animals had to be the oldest and biggest and you look at all the various sizes we know of today even from the fossil record and you do some calculating you come to the conclusion that the average size of the land animal is actually smaller than a sheep you know, you've really got to take your hat off to Noah because he was a cracking effort on his part. Not only had he disseminated these 200 families of beetles to make sure that he got all the right pairs, but he also managed to get young adult animals for all the larger animals and think what a pain in the ass that would have been he needs to get a couple of elephant seals walruses penguins kangaroos he's globe trotting around the planet but he needs to do it really quick because these animals are growing up and he needs to keep them as young adults because he needs them to be small. This is a bit of a this is a bit of a head scratcher. How he manages? He's a bit like Father Christmas, isn't he? How he manages to travel round and go down everybody's chimney in a single fucking night. Noah is doing that with all these animals, globe trotting round picking these animals up. Not to mention the trials and tribulations. As I recall in the Bible, once the flood waters recede, he spends most of his time shagging his daughters and getting pissed whereas really what he needs to be doing is traveling to the north pole to make sure there's some polar bears over there and the south pole to make sure there's some penguins over there and sorting out all the other animals in between what an effort on noah's part it's really got to be said
and you do some calculating, you come to the conclusion that the average size of the land animal is actually smaller than a sheep. But let's just use a sheep as the average size for the sake of argument. So now we've got the size of the average animal, a sheep, and we have the maximum number of sheep, 30,000. So are we going to need a bigger boat? Well, let's see how big it really was and if 30,000 sheep could fit on it. Back to the Bible. Genesis 6.15. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Genesis 6.16. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Using what's known as the small cubit, that makes the ark approximately 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and about 45 feet high, with three decks, a door, and a window. Well, you know, we've heard some naive bullshit in this video, but this just about takes the biscuit. This is the pinnacle. We've actually hit the pinnacle now that you could have a 440 foot all wooden boat that's going to survive under these kinds of conditions that I've described. We've built large wooden boats in the past, not as big as this. They need substantial amounts of steel bracing. Let me read you an entry on the list of the largest wooden ships of all time here. Um, and this was for the Great Republic from about 150 years ago. This was a boat that was 335 feet long. This is the entry that it gives on the Wikipedia page. This American ship used iron bolts and reinforced with steel, including 90 36 foot long cross braces, uh, iron cross braces, steel cross braces and metal keelsons. The Museum of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology noted that with this behemoth, Mackay had pushed wooden ship construction to its practical limits, even with this substantial amount of steel involved. A boat that was a hundred foot shorter than is being claimed for this arc was barely ocean worthy under normal ocean conditions not conditions that involve seven and a half or 15 feet of rain falling every single hour seven and a half or 15 feet or whatever of sea rise caused from waters from the deep and mile high uh, swells caused from these uprisings on the ocean bed. What an absolute load of bullshit could a ship like this have survived for 40 days and 40 nights? I think it's debatable whether it could have survived for 40 seconds before it had been turned into matchwood. I think you can gather what my conclusions are on this video. Let's see what the videographer's conclusions are. Well, there you have it. Simple reading of scripture, simple math, basic science. This fallible claim against the Bible is debunked. Adios. Oh shit, well there you go. There's no problems with the Noah's Ark story after all, at least not according to this guy. You know, what it shows for me, this whole Noah's Ark story, you can envisage the people at the time understanding this story and from that little parochial experience of the world which we don't have now we've seen so much more of it we know so much more about it you can understand it ringing true from that perspective when the world that you know of is just the world outside the front door when just the animals that you know of are the animals that are around you when the conditions that you understand are just the conditions that are around you then you can make a story like this work but to try and take that story from that context and still make it work in the modern era is absolutely absurd. I actually wonder if the people at the time, if they could, if you could bring them forward into the future, they'd look at some of these biblical literalists and say, are you out of your mind? How can, it was all right for us to understand this story, but you must be fucking stupid if you're taking this literally knowing everything that you know now. It clearly can't work knowing what you know now. Well, listen, I've waffled on way too much for this video. I hope you found something in it that's interesting. Thank you for watching if you've watched this far and bye for now.